Well, good day to you. This is Brother Dean Lundy with the Landmark Baptist Church and from the Landmark Baptist Church pulpit. It is good to have you tuned in today to this message. And I'm going to preach to you today on this subject. Is this the end? Is this the end? Before I get into this, before I read into our scriptures, let me just remind you that you can look up our church on its website, LandmarkBaptistChurch.online. That'll take you also to some connections to where you can be part of our YouTube upload videos. Now, at the time of this making here, of course, we are in a social distancing campaign, and we want to make sure that uh, our, the word is still gotten out, especially to all our people, anybody else that would like to tune in there also. And uh, many things, many questions, of course, have been asked during these days and time. I'm going to kind of answer that a little bit. I won't be try, try not to be, <laughs> try not to be lengthy, uh, but I do think this will help us here. Those many questions have been asked. I'm going to read you just a few verses here. I'll be in Luke, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 24 and uh, verse number one. The Bible said, and Jesus went out departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? I'm going to stop reading right there, and then we'll pray, and then we'll jump right into the message for this day. Heavenly Father, I do pray you take these thoughts, Lord, as you've laid them on our heart, as you've taught us those things through the years. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to come for the hearts of anyone that may be listening today. May thy will be done, and Lord, if someone doesn't know you, oh, Holy Spirit of God, touch their heart today that they may be convicted of that so they can turn to you and meet you. Oh, what a wonderful love that you have for us. Father, I pray that be the will today in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter number 24, the disciples asked Jesus these questions here. And this question basically is repeated in Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter number 21. The question is this. He said, they said, Lord, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of of the world. Over the past few weeks, there have been a lot of questions about this uh, pandemic of uh, coronavirus. And I've heard questions like this Is this a Bible plague? Is it a plague of Bible prophecy? And I'd like to kind of take time and uh, answer that question here today. I want to use, first of all, as an illustration. Uh, last week when I was mowing the yard and uh, just as I was just thinking meditating on the things of God uh, as I was mowing the yard I was just kind of cruising along you know how it is when you've got a yard to mow you've got a maybe you're on a riding mower and you're going across the park that doesn't have a lot of uh, flower beds no trees just that wide open yard what do we do well what we do is we just uh, nothing to slow us down, hit the gas, go to higher gear, and we just speed on, zoom, try to get across that yard to get it mowed. Now, I've got trees at places in my yard. I've got flower beds. I've got bird po birdhouse poles, uh, bushes, decorative objects, all kinds of things like that. And in the very center of our property sits my house. Now, the yard, of course, goes all the way around, and even then some kind of goes out. But I noticed this as I was moving out in the open, free of any kind of obstacles, I started approaching the house. Now, that big object, that house, that big object right in the middle of everything, as I was approaching it, I noticed three things change. First of all, my awareness changed. Something has to be done or I'm going to hit the house. I'm going to crash. No more fifth gear, no more open throttle, no more taking across a wide open space in the yard. But my awareness changed. The second thing that changed was the atmosphere. You say, what do you mean by that? As I entered the shadow of the house, things got cooler. 
Now I've got a bald spot on, on top of my head. I know that. I went from sun to shade. And every time that you near an object, it was it will always cast a shadow from the sunshine. The third thing that changed when I got nearer my house as I was mowing the yard was my acceleration changed. You see, mowing around objects demands lower speed. Around my house, I've got drain pipes, I've got window wells, I've got porch that sticks out and juts out, little uh, flowers, butt bushes, and things like that. So what happens, I have to slow down, and my acceleration changes. Now, with all that in mind, these times that are changing have done those three things for us. What's this? The very fact that people are asking the question of Bible prophecy means that people have gotten to thinking. There is an awareness that's going on now. The, the interruption of what we call normal life has made us aware of vulnerability. We're thinking more of priorities and family values during these days. We try to distinguish between governmental control and the freedom of our society. Our awareness has changed as we come closer to an object. Not only that, the atmosphere has changed. I don't know if you noticed or not, but people, they're taking precautions, and justly so. But when you go out into public to do some kind of shopping, maybe it's that time of week when you plan to set aside, it's like people are looking at you with suspicion. They're thinking, hmm, is he infected or is she infected? Now, I saw two people that haven't seen each other for a long time and they, they didn't hug or shake hands. They just stood back and waved and talked and kind of backed up as they were doing it. There is an atmosphere change. There's no sitting down to eat inside. When you see... Uh, when you see someone that's unshaven and they're still in their pajamas, maybe it looks like they're unwashed, you really take a wide berth around them because you think, hey, if they're not clean, then maybe they have a disease. Suspicion has captured our normalcy because our awareness has changed and the atmosphere has changed. Not only that, our acceleration has changed. We've been compelled to not run everywhere when we need just a small little item. We make a list and go out when we plan to. Traffic is much lighter on the highways. We seem to watch out more for the little things that we used to take for granted and we kind of plan around those things. I'm saying that uh, as, th as an object gets closer, things change. Now, why are we doing all of this? I'll tell you why. Because something is ahead. Something is ahead. Jesus preached 16 messages throughout the, his ministry while he was here on the earth. In Matthew chapter 23, 25, in Mark 13 and Luke 21, he preached about this subject, the days that will come. His disciples asked him, when shall these things be? That's a fair question. They believed him, God. If it's his world, and it is, why not ask about the end of the world? They had some knowledge that the world will not last forever. Way back in Deuteronomy, God was telling them about the latter days. Remember Balaam? Balaam was the fellow that went and tried to, uh, God hired him to curse God's people. But Balaam went down there, God turned his words around, and he blessed God's people. That was in the book of Numbers. And Balaam's prophecy that angered Balaam, the guy that tried to hire him, told all about the latter days that were going to take place. In Jude verse number 14, Enoch was an Old Testament prophet, and he prophesied the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. That was even before the flood. And before Christ came, the very first time. Isaiah spoke about the last days. Jeremiah spoke that in the latter days. Micah tells of the latter days. Ezekiel spoke of the prophecy concerning God's plan and the new kingdom that, that he rules from during the millennial reign in that millennial temple. Now listen, wanting to know what is happening is our curiosity. And as preachers have been preaching for centuries what God said, it seems that a glory 
global pandemic has gotten our attention more than just your average local catastrophe. If they can be called average, it's not average usually to those that it does affect. Now, when Jesus preached his sermon about the days that will come, we must look at context and comparison of other passage to see how this may affect us in this day and time. Let me say, first of all, Christians have the Bible insight to know one great thing. God has a plan for this world. He designed it, he directs it, and he will destine that plan. This is God's world by creation. It's God's world by ownership. And because man has rejected God, doesn't change that fact. God has not let go of his creation. He holds it all together. And even though it suffers the consequences of man's rebellion, God will overrule and have his way. As I use this illustration of mowing and things changing when I approach an object, so I must say that things that things have and are changing as we approach the object of God's plan. You see, objects have shadows. That's what we're seeing right now in this day and time. When Jesus spoke in the last days, he was speaking to the Jews. So when he said there will be signs such as false prophets, wars, commotions, devastations, he was teaching about the days of tribulation period. It will be a time of Jacob's trouble. That is the object that is to come. But remember this, when Jesus came to the earth, the first time he came into his own, he started preaching about his kingdom. People were rallying to him. The disciples believed him and even asked him uh, or asked to sit beside him when he took over. Now, we know that God's plan was greater than just what the disciples saw in the midst of his ministry. Jesus started the church. Now, this came to be an instrument of, that God would use to reach all the world and not just the Jews, because Jesus, of course, did come just to the Jews at first. And while he was on the earth, he was sent to his own, and that, of course, the Jews. But the Jews rejected their own. They rejected Christ with this statement. We have no king but Caesar. Remember when Jesus was on trial and being crucified there? The first days of the church in the book of Acts was again to the Jewish nation. Remember when Jesus stood on the mountain to sit to ascend back into heaven? Once again, the disciples asked him, Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, the gospel did not come to the Gentiles until after the church had its foundation established. Those first few converts of the, the, uh, of the church in the book of Acts were the Jews. Now with that in mind, I want you to listen to this. The church did not replace Israel. The church is known as the bride of Christ. Now, this is important because the messages Jesus gave were to the nation of Israel, not to the church. All those when Jesus was telling about that we read in our text, those were to his people. He told about what they would go through and how the events would surround them. Where? When? Rather, in the last Days, Israel will be dealt with alongside its enemies, but the church is not a nation, it's a beloved bride. So, when someone asks, say, Brother Dean, is this uh, virus one of the last day's plagues Jesus talked about? What's this? The church is not appointed to wrath, the church is being adorned for a wedding. So this is not one of those last plagues Jesus talked about in Matthew 20, uh, uh, 24 there in Luke chapter number 21. The only thing the church should be anticipating is the rapture. 
That's the, that's the one thing. You see, Jesus spoke of future events that will be judgment from the wrath of the Lamb. He's going to pour out those uh, within a seven-year period. That's not dealing with the church. The church should be looking for Jesus to come in the clouds so he can take us out of here. Because at the end of that seven-year judgment, there will be the signs that Jesus told about that he's getting ready to make his appearance. But all those signs deal nothing with the church. We will be gone. Jesus will not let anything happen to his bride. He's going to take care of his bride out of his own wrath. Now, I'm not preaching. Watch this now. I'm not preaching. Some pie in the sky. Don't worry or be complacent because that's not what the Bible teaches. As a church, even though those last day plagues are not for us, we should always be ready because even though there are many signs for the second appearing of Christ, there are no signs given to point us to the rapture. Truth is, if the shadows, those things Jesus was talking about, are happening now, and his coming is at the end of seven years, how much closer are we to the trumpet sounding? Yea, even today. So, let me say again, God has a plan for the world. That's the object that we are approaching. Now, what we see today, God has given us a preview of that plan. All right, in Matthew chapter number 24, these other passages I talked about a few minutes ago, Jesus gave us what those signs were during that tribulation period. There will be false Christs, the Bible said, those people that will deceive many, their ability to get to convince people that they are right. There will be fighting among the nations of people, wars and rumors of wars. The third thing, there will be famine and pestilences. Starvation always brings disease and poor health. Foundations of the earth will shake with diverse uh, earthquakes, the Bible says. Number five, there will be fake loyalty during that time right before Jesus comes back. The Bible says people will betray each other and, and hate who they once befriended. Fathers and sons will betray each other and children will turn on their parents. That's one of the signs that Jesus is getting ready to step out of heaven and take over here on this earth. The sixth sign that Jesus gives us in this passage is there will be a faithful witness to the truth. The Bible gives us this verse right here. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached uh, to all the world uh, for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Remember those two witnesses in the book of, Tri the book of Revelation? Tribulation period. They will be preaching. Preaching so much that the people of the world will hate them. Now here, those are the six signs that I just gave you that Christ is getting ready to appear. Things will be in such a chaotic state due to the Antichrist rule that only God himself uh, could straighten it out. And God will let Satan rule this world and it will be evident then that he doesn't have the wisdom or the power to hold things together. Right now, because we've left God out, we see only the previews of it falling Apart, But it's all going to fall apart one day. We've watched a generation fall away from God's outreach of grace and goodness. We see the confusion of religion in other ways. Family values have been per, uh, replaced by perversion. Kids today think their parents are foolish and only make connection because they can't support themselves. Look around this world and all the tragedies. We've always had them. But right now they're much, much more more frequent. We're on the verge of war at any moment. Everything is so unstable. What we see now is a shadow of things to come. Is it the last plagues? No, it's not. It's a shadow of what is coming. So to answer that question, is the coronavirus the last day's plague? I'll say not for three reasons. Number one, it's too early. It's too early. Whoa, Brother Dean, you setting times and all that? No. Let me, let me explain this. For this pandemic to be a part of Jesus' prophecy of the last days, then we would have, have to be in the tribulation period. 
But since the rapture has not happened yet, it's too early for it to qualify. You see, please don't get me wrong. The rapture could happen at any moment. By the time I finish this message, then all these things that are coming apart, coming uh, uh, to fruition here, all these things, friend, they will be pointing to Jesus Christ coming back. But until the rapture happened, all these predictions will not happen. We'll see some evidences. We'll see some beginnings of it because the devil always has to prepare way ahead of time. But it's too early if the rapture hadn't happened. Let me say this. The second reason the coronavirus is not a last day's plague is because it's too easy. It's too easy. Now, I say this cautiously and I say it very solemnly, but it's very truthful throughout this Bible. If you'll study the Bible judgment, you will be unnerved at the intensity of suffering and pain that will take place when God pours out his wrath. It will be so intense that men will cry for death over the severity of it. That's not to say that any disease that we may contract now is not painful and uh, severe personally. No one likes pain. Uh, but the suffering of the last day's prophecy is so severe that men will gnaw their tongues for pain. They will scream against God. At one point, men will be tormented so terribly that they will want to die, but death will flee from them. You say, Brother Dean, is this coronavirus a last day's plague? No, because it's too easy. I'm not saying people are not suffering because everybody goes through this. Any kind of uh, contracted disease is going to cause some suffering. But oh, when you read this Bible right here, all that suffering that's going to take place in the tribulation period right before Jesus Christ comes back will be 10,000 times worse than any coronavirus that is now. It's not the last day's plague because it's too early. It's not the last day's plague because it's too easy. Let me say this. It's not the last day's plague because it's too enigmatic. Now, what does that mean? An, in, an, an enigma is a puzzling situation. It's something where we ask a lot of questions, something difficult to figure out. During the tribulation period, mankind is going to know that the suffering they suffer is from the Lamb. The Bible says this, that they're going to run to the mountains and they're going to say, hey, fall on us and hide us. Not from the pain, not from the terrors, not from the destruction. Hide us from him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Let me say this, that this uh, coronavirus has been puzzling to a lot of people with a whole lot of questions. Let me say in the tribulation period when Jesus Christ pours out his wrath on this world, there will be no question that it's from God himself. The Bible said this in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 and 21. About this, it, it tells us about the state of man's mind during those days. Look what the Bible said. And the rest of the men, which are not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. The very indication that the tribulation population will not repent gives us insight that they know there's a God to repent to. How do they know that? Because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. There will be no mystery for the judgments then. Everyone will know that that wrath is from the Lamb. So let me say this. God has a plan. God has given us a preview. How does that affect us? How does that affect us? God says, don't postpone your preparation. Don't, oh, Brother Dean, you know what? I'm just going to wait and see how things work out, and then I'm going to get saved. Then I'm going to get right with God. My friend, God may shut the door before you get a chance. Don't postpone your relationship with God. 
Let me ask you, how is your relationship with God? Do you know him as Savior? Do you talk to him if you are saved? Do you live in his presence? None of this earth, my friend, is going to last. All men by nature are condemned. If this coronavirus hastens that end, then it will hasten that end. We can prepare as much as we can, but if a virus that we can't see affects us, then we still must turn to God. We can't stop time. We can't stop God's plan. But we can be ready to meet him when he comes. Let me close with this. In Matthew 25, 31, Jesus ends his prophetic message with a truth that is often misunderstood by readers. He says at the end of all that is going to happen, right at the end of his message right here, he will gather all nations and separate them. He will set the sheep on his right hand and he'll set the goats on his left hand. He will then say to the sheep, inherit the kingdom. The ones on the left, the goats, he will say this, uh, depart from me into everlasting punishment. Or he's going to send them to hell. Now, many of us think that that is the dividing up of the saved and the lost. But if we take this in context where Jesus is saying he's preaching at the end of the world, the signs of the coming of the Son of Man, and now he's come back and he gathers all the nations together because he's setting up his kingdom. All the tribulation judgments have come and gone and Jesus now sits on his earthly throne and those that have survived the tribulation will be brought before him. Now you may disagree with this, but this fits in the Bible, Bible prophecy, but this is a solemn thought right here. When Jesus is done with the tribulation period, he's cast the devil into uh, hell for a thousand years and he's sitting on the throne. He calls everybody to him. It is then that Christ will look into the hearts and decide if he will let them live during the millennium. You see, the deciding factor of that judgment is in the actions they did or didn't take in caring for his people or others, even the Jews. Right? What's this? That's not salvation. That's citizenship qualities. His kingdom will not have citizens that do not have a caring heart. God gave us insight to those that will be accepted into the kingdom. They survived the tribulation period, but if they didn't have that heart condition that God requires to live in his kingdom, I would say he will separate them and cast them into hell. You'd say, heavenly, that's not fair. If you said that, you would be wrong. You see, God's kingdom will not be based on everyone has rights. It will be based on is everyone right. God, the great judge, knows what's in a man's heart. He will show them, then he will sentence them. Life is in his hands. That's what's going to happen after the end of tribulation. If somebody said one time, Brother Dean, you believe uh, people will be saved during the tribulation period? I believe there'll be 144,000 Jews saved in the tribulation period. Those that have heard the gospel before uh, the rapture happened, they will not have an opportunity. I'll come back to that here in just a half a second. But uh, uh, those that survived the tribulation period, they will enter into Christ's kingdom here on this earth, not as a saved person. But God will uh, announce to them whether or not they are accepted. If not, he'll send them straight to hell. He said, but that's not fair. Wait a minute now. God holds your life. God holds your life. Salvation, my friend, is like this. It's a matter of the heart. If you think you can do it your own way, you are wrong. Christ is the only way. You must ask him to forgive you and receive him into your life today by that audible confession. If you do not do that now and have heard the Holy Ghost speaking to your heart, when the church is raptured away and the tribulation period begins, you will have less than seven years to live. Because if you haven't accepted 
the draw of the Holy Spirit now, you won't accept it then. You will not be at the gathering of nations because if you wouldn't listen to the Holy Spirit, then you have pronounced judgment sentence upon yourself and you will be judged during the tribulation period with the eternity of hell because of your rebellion to the truth now. Our brother Dean, God's a God of second chances. Yes, he is. Yes, he is, and thank God that he is. But if you put it off, your heart's not ready anyway. You put it off, you think, I'll be okay. Your heart's not ready, my friend. It's not ready. What's coming is coming. God promised it. Question is, are you prepared? Heavenly Father, I pray you take this thought. I pray, Lord, that you'll ask people, or that you'll speak to people's hearts, and they'll ask themselves, am I right with the Lord? Am I saved? Do I know Christ is my Savior? Or am I just religious? Father, I pray you please help everyone to turn to you, pour out their heart, tell you the truth about themselves, and Lord, I pray you work in their heart and life. All our heart, we love you, I do pray today. Good honor this message.